Fun Ideas Productions presents the Fun Ideas Podcast. We see the syphilitic shrinking obelisk. The white man's wilting dick. Of CD game show trolls, the smiling lie of the televised hive. The witches are watching with their thousand eyes. Witches are watching with their thousand eyes. We smell rotting teeth. That speak beyond belief. A stick inside their skull would... Hi, this is Mark Arnold, and welcome to Fun Ideas Podcast number 60. This episode is sponsored by the fine folks at Lee's Comics. Hi, I'm George Takei. You know me as Helmsman Sulu on Star Trek. When I'm not busy going Warp Factor 8, I like to beam down to Lee's Comics in Mountain View and spend a lazy afternoon reading comics classics from Marvel to DC, from Dark Horse to Fantagraphics, and everything in between. So please, spend some time here at Lee's Comics and spend your hard-earned cash. <laughs> The Fun Ideas Podcast is made possible by listeners like you and from Lee's Comics of California, selling you what your mother threw out since 1982, online at leescomics.com. Headquartered, the book on the monkey's solo career is, is just about done. My co-author, Michael A. Ventrella, will be attending Beetlefest and selling copies of it and our previous monkey's book there, taking advance orders if necessary. I'm still doing the final edits and image placement for the Total Television scrapbook. It looks really good, and I will be turning it in soon. I just got the assignment to do an article for Back Issue Magazine on Underdog, and I may have another article for them on Hee Haw! The Warren Kramer book is due back from the publisher, and I'm still working on my own Light Up Your Life travel agency, and of course, the Mad Book. Today's show features an artist and writer who was on the show just a couple months ago, but he wanted to talk about Harvey Comics with me, and he's back. So here he is again, Eric Schenauer. Okay, on the show today, I have the return of Eric Schenauer. How are you today, sir? I'm good, Mark. Thanks. And uh, you wanted to come back to the show, and I was happy to have you back for this reason, to talk about Harvey Comics, so let's do it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so... What was your first? Uh, what was your first Harvey comic that you remember seeing? Well, there was two. I mean, I talk about this in my books a couple times, but I'll you know, I don't uh-huh. mind repeating stories. So, uh, <laughs> when I was uh, I was born at the tail end of '66, and there were always like comic books around the house, probably about ten or twenty of them, just random stuff. In the random stuff. Uh, there was a copy of Friendly Ghost Casper number 110 and Wendy 44, and both were cover dated October 1967. So uh, I did have an older, or I still do have an older sister, so they may have been given to her or they gave her the Wendy and me the Casper, but, you know, I couldn't read them at first. I remember not being able to read them and then eventually able to read them so those are the first harvey comics i ever had (laughs) now i'll answer a question and then i'll ask you one uh the first one i ever bought is when i was um we were traveling to hawaii when i was six years old in 1973 my parents said oh you can buy a comic book to take on the plane with you and my sister and i'm uh, actually bought Harvey Comics. She bought a Casper the Ghost Land and I bought a Sad Sack Laugh Special. And I enjoyed that so much that when we came back, I begged them to let me buy another comic. So I bought a Richie Rich Jackpots. But anyway, <laughs> uh-huh. that's my earliest Harvey memories. So, <laughs> how about you? <laughs> well, I, I mean, 
remember, this would have been the very early 70s, I remember seeing some, uh, at least one Hot Stuff comic that a friend, well, it wasn't a friend, it was like parent, my parents' friends who had kids that were my, around my age, and they had some comics. They were driving across the country or something, and they stopped to visit us. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it was the other way around. I don't know. Anyway, we were with this, this other family, and they had some comics, and they had at least one Hot Stuff comic, and I was, I remember reading it, and I really, I was drawn to it. <laughs> um, I think that was the first, that, I think that's my earliest memory. Um, there was one time when, for some reason, just out of, I don't know where it came, where the impetus came from, but I told my dad I wanted to buy a comic book. <laughs> fan I will I will say about myself no but I'll tell you more in a minute <laughs> yeah um I I did later um I think I mean I, I liked that com I, I love that Casper comic I still have that very copy mm -hmm. um but I remember buying other different comics I remember buying an Archie comic about a life with Archie at one point I bought an Astonishing Tales Kazar and Doctor Doom at one point Mm -hmm. um, but I did go back to Harvey Comics, and that's what I bought pretty consistently. Um, maybe every once in a while I get an Archie or a Disney comic, but I often, it was odd. I mean, I became obsessed with uh, Harvey Comics, especially Richie Rich. Mm -hmm. I would just long, long for them, and any time I knew we were driving by 7-Eleven, I would um, ask to stop to buy a comic. Uh, Sunday, Sundays after church, we always had to go to 7-Eleven so I could buy a comic. And my sister usually bought one as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think I sort of probably coerced her. It wasn't too hard, but I always, would always encourage her very strongly <laughs> to get some Harvey comic. And she usually did, although she liked, she liked some of the Disney comics too. I remember she often liked Chip and Dale. Uh, but I would rather that she would buy Harvey comics. Mm -hmm. Cause of course, we read each other's comics. Right. As well as the ones we bought ourselves. Yeah. I, but I, I, I after a say. while, after a while, I was just, it was an obsession. <laughs> I don't think it was an obsession for me until the 1980. That's when it was. I would buy random Harvey comics, especially throughout the 70s especially if it was like something significant like i i'm sure you've seen these uh like the richie rich casper and wendy national league issue yes uh, absolutely yeah. i remember uh, that was like a piece of gold yeah <laughs> yes that was like my favorite comic for yeah. a while absolutely favorite comic for yeah. a while and then richie rich zillions was uh, touted as 68 pages and I said wow that's a big book you know because I didn't know about the earlier giants I mean by the time I yeah. started reading they were all slim and yeah. uh, you know one thing I was going to say on, on those earlier ones that I had way back when when I went to uh, shop for the ones when we went to Hawaii when I was a kid I didn't know comics were constantly being produced I don't know the deal on it so in the early Casper and Wendy that I had, they had um, uh, the advertising pages that they used to reproduce all the covers. Yeah. And so I'd scan down these covers and saying, oh, I want this, I want that, I want that. Of course, now I do have them all, but at the time, 
<laughs> you know, I, I, I just figured they were just like books. They're on sale at the store, just a matter of getting to them. So you mentioned hot stuff. It's like, so that was actually a character I was looking for, you know, and uh, there wasn't any on the stands. You know, this is 73. I, they were still publishing hot stuff, but Richie Rich yeah. had already started taking over, so there's far more Richie titles. Uh, on the stands, and I was like, "Where's hot stuff?" And I don't know, if, you know, there was any issues with hot stuff being a devil or anything like that. You know, I don't think so. But you know, you definitely saw more Casper, Sad Sack, and Richie on the stands than anything else in the early seventies. That's what I remember. Okay. Well, I remember when it started, they started becoming when Richie started becoming overbearing. <laughs> of course, he was, Richie Rich was my favorite at yeah. the time, mm-hmm. so that was okay with me, but, you know, Little Dot disappeared, this is about like 1975, Little yeah. Dot disappeared, Little Lotta disappeared, Little Audrey disappeared. Yeah. I was never buying um, Baby Huey new, those were already gone Yeah. by the time I was buying Harvey Comics. Um and I never saw any of those on the stands either. I was like, you know, and I remember those being advertised too in the 67 books. And it's like, where are these titles? Because I always thought things yeah. got published forever too. I didn't think they canceled anything. How would they do that? Why would they do that? You know? <laughs> I guess I, I knew this happened. Yeah. I don't remember how, but yeah, I knew there were new titles every month. Yeah. Um, one thing that I saw when I was looking at Harveyville sometimes after I, I, I bought it and reading most of it, but you had, there was an article on Bunny mm-hmm. in there, and there was there was one issue of Bunny. See, I, I used to go into an, antiquarian bookstores, because I was also interested in Oz books as mm. a kid. Yeah. So uh, my mom would take me to antiquarian bookstores every once in a while, and we would look for Oz books or other things. And often there was, you know, a stack of comics in the corner. So I would have access to you know, what seemed to me ancient Harvey comics. And so I knew that the Richie Rich, uh, the giant ones used to be longer yeah. than they yeah, the eventually square, became. The square bound ones, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, and I would look at all the ads and there were like things like Bee Man and the Cow Sills and I would see the <laughs> covers advertised. And, but of course, I... These were long gone off the stands, and they weren't, you know, there were no more issues. Right. So I was always curious about those. And I would see Bunny, and that was a sort of regular comic at the time. Mm-hmm. It was being published in when, the mid 60s or something. Yeah, it mid-60s. lasted about four years and then vanished. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw these covers, but I never, never saw an issue. And then in 1976, yeah. there was like issue 11 of Bunny, so I bought it, and I thought it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I felt the same way. Actually, like... it, actually, since I know my numbering, it was actually issue twenty-one. But anyway, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I I saw that too. I don't think I saw it on the stands, but a little bit afterwards. And I and I always thought it would look like Dan DiCarlo art, and it was anything but. <laughs> I was like, whoa! <laughs> if he was drunk in his sleep. <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, yeah, it was obviously what they were going for. Right. The, the Archie, Archie Comics vibe, but it was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, and I've never read one of the originals from yeah. back in the 60s. Yeah. Um, I, if I saw one that was, you know, like only like a couple bucks, I would buy it. Yeah. I'm not going to shell out tons and tons of money to buy these things. But uh, I would, I, I am curious are slightly curious to see an, an original Bunny comic from the 60s because I didn't know afterward like after I started knowing more about comics like was this all stuff that they had been stockpiling in a, a file drawer somewhere and then finally they decided to bring it out or was all his work commissioned new for this relaunch of Bunny I don't know um, probably the, it was uh, stockpile and that the, they need to do that they did that with Baby Huey once they issued issue 90 nine i think in 1980 and it hadn't been published in almost 10 years and it's like yeah. and i bought that one off the stands and i was like yay more bo- baby huey and then that was it <laughs> 
for a while. I mean, when Harvey right. sold, they put out some new Baby Huey issues then. But, I mean, I was all excited that they were doing new ones in 1980. And it's like, finally, something other than Richie. I was like, you. It's like, you know, there's a little Richie. Oh, there's more Richie. Now there's too much Richie. <laughs> <It's> like, <Wow. laughs> and uh, as far as Bunny goes... I never really cared for the character or the series, but just because it's kind of quirky, I ended up buying all of them, plus the Fruit Man special and the rock uh-huh. happening and all that <laughs> stuff. And I don't have every Harvey ever published, but I mean, I have all those kind of quirky ones like that. And uh, the only thing I can say that's uh, any sort of um, you know positive thing about it is that the artists that did uh, Bunny, which were high... Eisman and High Rosen, respectively, uh, did better stuff elsewhere. <laughs> so, you know, but I used to say they're horrible artists, and then I found out, oh, yeah, they did better stuff stuff earlier when they were younger or whatever, or, uh, you know, working on other things. So, uh huh. Yeah. I knew High Eisman. Yeah, and he's still around, too. I think he Is does he? Popeye Sundays now, and he's like 95 okay. or something like that. So. Uh huh. <laughs> And I talked to him once on the phone a couple of years ago, and you know he's very nice and everything like that. And yeah, he's a great guy. He taught me the letter at the Kubert School. Oh wow! Okay, so you actually met him face to face. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. We wow. had him every week mm-hmm. for a couple of years. Yeah. So apparently, unless you know, I've got my facts incorrect. He's still doing brand new Popeye Sundays. I think the dailies nobody does them, and they just reprint things if there's anything in the paper. But, uh, you know, I guess they keep it going just for copyright reasons or something. I don't know. (laughs) But he's ghosted on a lot of different comic strips over the years. So, you know, I don't even know all of them. It's like Cats and Jammer Kids and Gasoline Alley and all those type of things. So Yeah. I think when I was at at the Cuba School, this was the early 80s, he was um, drawing Little Little Iodine. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then High Rose and I never met, but he had done some stuff over at Marvel and Atlas, like in the 50s and stuff, that was actually a lot better. <laughs> so, you know. Uh-huh. Um, and then later on, High Rose and came back before he passed away, and he did, uh, they got him back to do uh, the New Kids on the Block comic books, which are pretty wretched, but, <laughs> so, you know. Even though I have friends that worked on those, so I can't be too harsh on it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, let's see, what else? But, uh, like, and then they had Fruit Man, which was a backup feature, and then he got one issue, but, uh, Ernie Cologne did the Fruit Man special, I believe, if I'm correct. Uh-huh. I might be wrong on that uh-huh. one, but, uh, I know he did some of the stories, and, you know, so, yeah, Bunny is, is its own weird thing, but, uh, I did manage to secure the Bunny Ball in club fan button (laughs) which is almost impossible to find and I still do to this day don't have the fan club card that they advertised or the poster that they advertised in old issues of Harvey so I just Uh wonder how many people responded to these things because some of these little comic book related trinkets like like the Archie fan club is that that button's pretty easy to find you know but anything Harvey is like almost impossible seems like you know I still have my my forty five. Which one was that one? I bought the Casper Richie Rich one. Oh, okay. um, the you know Casper, what you doing on the moon? And Richie Rich, the richest kid in the world. Mm-hmm. Did you just have the picture sleeve on it or no? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, because later on they ran out of the picture sleeves, and so they just sell them in plain old white sleeves. <laughs> oh no, I didn't. no. That's the only one I ever bought. I wish I had bought all the rest, but no, I've only downloaded those from YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> I, I memorized the Casper one and the Richie Rich one from playing them over and over and over. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of funny, you know, people people prize these things and they're like, I wish I bought them whenever anybody reproduces the ad on like the Facebook page. And I go, well, you can listen to them here on YouTube. And then they come back and they go, those aren't that good. <laughs> and I, I said, nobody ever said they were good, you know, it's like... <laughs> Oh, uh, well, yeah. Uh, the Casper one is kind of catchy. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, I'm trying to think which one I, I probably like the best. Yeah, the Casper one's pretty good, I guess. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the other ones, and I'm going, mm. <laughs> But it's just funny that they didn't do all the characters. They did most of them, but they still left a few off, you know, but I guess... Uh, I don't know how well those records sold or anything. I mean, I don't think there's sales figures on such things. And, the, you know... It, you know, if you read my book, I talk about the infamous Harvey Warehouse, which, when I first heard about it, I thought it was like this wonderful, like Disneyland type place where you walk in. There's there's stacks of comics and records and toys and everything, and then I found out later it was like in a big trash heap, just a bunch of junk. <laughs> it's like, aw, <Aww. laughs> ruined my illusions here. <laughs> that is not the chocolate factory. Um, my mother did not want me to order anything out of a comic book. The first time I did, I ordered, like, X-ray specs or something and disappearing ink or something, mm-hmm. and the stuff never came. Uh. Uh, and my mother wrote to the company, and they said, they wrote back, and they said something like, "Our uh, oh, our manufacturing is down right now or something like that. It was just some scam. But they didn't send the money back? <laughs> no, no, we never got anything back. Terrible. <laughs> Harvey advertised these uh, records, and I was like, "Oh, I want them! Yeah. I want them!" So, but my so my mother let me order them grudgingly, yeah. and they actually came. <laughs> so that was well, it was just one record, so that was good. Yeah. But uh, I guess probably her. Uh, well, you know, I probably didn't want to spend my money on anything but comic books, right? And that's why I didn't. But order any more records because I just wanted the comics. Although you got free comics with the records, so I, I doesn't make sense. I just don't remember why I didn't order anymore. <laughs> now, since you did, you got it that way, because um, I never ordered anything. I, you know, I've always seen those records just on eBay or at uh, a couple yeah. sales. Uh, when you received it in the mail, was it poly bagged or anything? What did it come? What did it look like? God, I don't remember oh. opening the package. <laughs> Right. I don't. I don't remember any other packaging. And they sent a couple comics, like a Richie Rich comic and a Casper comic, because those were the those were the characters on the record. Mm-hmm. Um, for a while, I did remember which comics I got with the record. Yeah. And I think it was a. I think the Richie Rich one was a issue of Richie Rich Money World. Mm-hmm. But at this point, it's been so long, I just don't remember. Yeah. I was just curious um, about the packaging because I know later. Uh, you know, they had, you know, various publishers did like three for a dollar where they polybag, you know, just random older books. Right, but, uh, right. Harvey went a step further, and I have a few of these where they threw in one of the records with them, too. And oh. Probably just to get rid of them. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I was wondering if you received yours that way, if it was all loose. It sounds like it was all loose, so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do remember those bags. <laughs> Three records, three comics in a bag. Yeah. Where did I see those? Were those on the stands? Well, I never saw them on the stand. The only time I've ever seen those was on eBay. Although people have said, "Where did you grow up?" I forgot. Sorry. I grew up all over the place. I mean, on coast. when you were a kid, for the most part. Just I, I, my dad was in the military. We moved every every six months to three years. We were okay. somewhere different. So you, I used to buy ever, comics all over the place. Okay, were you um, ever in New York when you were a kid? No. Okay, or that general area, because that's where I heard that they sold a lot of those things, like the polybag stuff, on, on newsstands, whereas I grew up in California, and none of that stuff made it out there, to my knowledge. You know. Right, I'm trying to remember. Oh, my goodness. But I did see polybag comics for, like, uh, Gold Key. That was, like, the fr- way I saw Gold Key for the longest time. They'd sell three for a dollar, like, at just various, you know, department stores yeah. or whatever, you know. And it's like you'd have to kind of uh, move the bag around a little bit yeah, to, to see what the, mid- which the middle one Yeah, was. exactly, yeah. because it's like you get, like, um, I don't know, you mentioned Chip and Dale. Like, it'd be a Disney one, and it's like Chip and Dale on this side and Arista Kittens on this side. It's like, is there anything good in this? And it's like, oh, there's a Donald Duck in there. Okay, maybe I'll get this one. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they must have sold those, like, in department stores or general yeah general stores or something like that i 
guess those, yeah, those would have been mid-70s. I, yeah, now I'm thinking about it. Maybe it was just the gold key ones I saw. Okay. I feel like I saw all different publishers. Well, yeah, late, in the that. later 70s, I, I, and this was still through Whitman, uh, and that's why you see him, is like they'd package up Star Wars for Marvel and some DC comics, and they'd slap on the Whitman logo instead of DC or Marvel. That's why you see those variants like that. And they were in the bags like that, so... There is some sort of deal going on. I don't know all the details about it. And then by the yeah. time comic stores came along, all that stuff ended. So it's like that was yeah. the end of that. Yeah. But uh, uh, I know the reason why Western Publishing or Gold Key started doing that is because by the early 70s, their titles really started suffering on the newsstands. And uh, they had to figure out a way to have them have a longer shelf life and to sell more in bulk you know, like you know, right. if you're selling a fifteen cent or twenty cent book, uh, it's better to sell three for a dollar or something, or three for fifty cents or whatever the price was. You know, just to get yeah. a little more money out of somebody. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, I don't know what Harvey's excuse was. Um, I, I think in there, you know, it was just probably overstock. But I, as far as I know, most of the uh, Richie comics, especially, sold well throughout the seventies. So it wasn't until the early eighties that things started suffering for them. Right. I stopped buying Harvey Comics for the most part around 77, 78, I guess. Mm -hmm. The one title I stuck with for a while was Richie Rich and Casper, Mm -hmm. because that was my favorite. But, you know, I would go and, I guess by that time I was buying them in uh, military exchanges, Mm -hmm. um, because in my late high school years we lived on base. All all during high school we lived on bases. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would be really embarrassed. <laughs> you know, I would buy, I would have all these DC comics and some Marvel comics, and then I'd have like this Harvey comic, and I'd be embarrassed. <laughs> so I'd hide it in the middle of the stack when I bought comics and hope nobody noticed. <laughs> but that was, but Rich Rich and Casper was the only one I, I stuck with for yeah. a while. Well, that's a good choice. I mean, it was all new material. Yeah. And it was definitely all yeah. all Kremlin, Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, after like four or five years, everything would be reprints. Yeah, and I it's like who needs these anymore? I wouldn't buy them. Yeah, I mean, there's a few titles that stayed all new, like the Richie Rich title itself. It was all new, but uh, like Friendly Ghost Casper by the, the late '70s, unless it was like an anniversary issue or something, or the Cub Scout ones, it was all reprints by that point. You know, so yeah. it's like yeah. Well, I think they were reprinting in the earlier earlier too. They were just oh, I yeah. just didn't know it because I hadn't bought the earlier ones. Yeah. Well, they used to kind of hide the reprints more, like in the Giants and stuff like that. And then later, they kind of threw well, that through through that. Weren't out the Giants? The what? Giants were all reprints, weren't they? Even uh, from the beginning. No, there's some weren't that they? are all new. Strangely enough, like if you they? Hmm. if you get the original issues of Richie Rich Success that are square bound, all new stories. <laughs> so it's it's frustrating as a Harvey fan. You know, it's like people say, "Why don't you make heads or tails out of this?" And I said. I'd love to. Does anybody want to pay me? Because, I mean, it's, it's a massive project. It, you know, because you really have to go through, like, 5,000 issues, you know. Right. Um, right. You know, I would do it if somebody wanted to sit down with me and do it with me and just say, we're going to find out what the news stories are in the news. The only thing I could say is everybody can continue plugging away and putting things on Grand Comic Database, which I put a few things up. So, you know, eventually it should all get up there, but... Yeah, do you do you remember? Or did you ever correspond with a guy named Quentin Clem? No, he was a huge Harvey fan. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, young in his early forties, and uh, he amassed like all the Harveys very early on. And he and I struck up conversation when I started Harveyville Fun Times and he he was the one that discovered all that crazy stuff that you know that Richie Rich success was brand new and I didn't believe him at first so I said you gotta be kidding they put brand new stories in there and it's like yeah <laughs> and you know now that I have virtually all the books I certainly have all the Richie books he was right and it's like it's it's really frustrating and then here's another thing that's frustrating you could say oh I have all the Richie books ever and the lot is in the dots let's say um so i have everything richie no <laughs> you have to get those issues a little max and mutton and jeff and junk because they put brand new stories that never were reprinted anywhere <laughs> in those books <laughs> and uh wow because 
I just skip over those whenever I see them. Yeah. And well, they're not in every issue, so you have to find out which yeah, ones are which. Yeah. You know? It's like, yeah, and they don't always promote it on the covers. There's certain issues of Mutt and Jeff, they'll put Richie Rich. Guest starring Richie Rich, but they didn't say that all the time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, it can be very frustrating. I think in my book, I have every possible appearance. I mean, thanks to Quentin's help and just my own uh, thing. Research. Yeah. And one of the things he left me with before he passed away, <laughs> which now I found a few more, and I, I've never figured out why they did this unless it had something to do with what we're talking about, those polybag comics. There's a few issues of uh, some Harvey comics that came out about 72. Um, I'd have to look it up, but it's a couple little dot issues, a couple hot stuff issues, and a couple of Richie Rich issues or something, that they put out both 15 cent standard issues and 25 cent giant issues and uh same cover and most of the same stories but then the giants have more stories obviously and the only way you can really tell them apart is cover price and that the giant has a big circle that says 52 pages or something like that yeah but um Wow. They're really hard to find because a lot, a lot of people, when they're selling an old Richie or something, they just use a stock photo. So unless you're going to ask somebody, uh, do you have the 52-page version or the 36-page version, they're not going to tell you. <laughs> and more often than not, it probably is the, the, the giant anyway. So the the hard ones to find are the slimmer ones, and I think those were put in the bags with the with the, the records. Yeah, so... <laughs> But, yeah, Quentin, a couple years before he died, he pointed that out. He goes, I just made this discovery, and he found three of them, and, but now i found there's like six of them. So it's like, you know, does it, it, does it never end? You know, and if, you know, if like Harvey Comics were published by Marvel or DC, everybody would know all the little variants and the, blah, 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 and the you know, it's like, this is the Star Wars one, it's 35 cents, and this one's 30 cents, and this is the Whitman reprint, and blah, 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 you know, nobody cares yeah. about Harvey. And so... I have to find this stuff, and then I'll tell the price guy, and they go, eh, whatever, and they don't put it in there, and that's the end of that, so. I know. Oh, that's too bad, but it's, yeah, like, all this information that no one cares about, but it's like, oh, wow, but then who cares? Yes. <laughs> well. It's sort of sad. The only I thing I'm know. happy about, and, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny. I, I've never really confessed this anywhere except maybe to a couple friends. You know, uh, you know how some people, they work on some sort of project, and they go, I hope I survive so I can get this project done, because if I die right now, it's not going to be done correctly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, it really matters. But anyway, you know, in the long run. But, you know, I was really thinking about that on the Harvey Comics Companion when I did that book, because I said, at last I can get all the information I know after doing this for 30 years, and it would suck that if I passed away right before the book came out so you know it would be wrong you know and it's like so now I can die happy because the book came out a couple of years ago and it's like yeah, <laughs> anyway. yeah. Um, congratulations now your life is fulfilled yes exactly and I've never thought that about any book I've done before or since I just go eh, well if it comes out it comes out it doesn't you know it's just that one because it was so personal to me and it's, it was such a long lengthy genesis from when I really became serious about wanting to do it and uh, you know the the, the actual sure. book being published you know so yeah well yeah I think probably many many different people feel that way about things projects that are really personal I certainly feel that way about mm -hmm. projects of mine it's like just gotta stay alive <laughs> And then I don't know if you've done this like when you're working on your Oz books or anything like that. You think the opposite. You go, I'm sick of this. I can't work on this anymore. <laughs> Which, well, um, there are certainly there are certainly uh, projects that I felt like that on. But yes. <laughs> I don't want to be dead. I just want them to be over. Yes, exactly. And I was kind of I was really that way in the Harvey book also because it's like, you know, I mean the next part of my story. Uh, is that I started getting a little more serious on Harvey's about the time you gave him up in the first place, like in the late 70s, because 
they seem like a curiosity to me because they still weren't putting who the artists and writers were and um, a friend of mine was a big Archie collector and so like in 6th grade this is like 77 or something 78 um, he would bring all his Archies to school and I'd bring all my Harveys to school and everybody in the classroom got to read them yeah. unfortunately I lost a few doing that and so I learned a lesson so I had to rebuy a few years later but that's okay um, but uh, he kept going on with the Archies, but for some reason Archie appealed to me quite a bit, but Harvey always had the the little extra oomph, I guess, to get me interested. I don't know why. Maybe it's the character design. I've never really figured it out, but um, by 1980, I was a, you know, it was so laughable how many Richies they were putting out. I was determined to start getting them every month. And uh, they had just raised the price from 40 cents to 50 cents when I decided to do this. And it's like, I, you know, I was still on an allowance. And so I had to, like, carefully spend my money so I can get all these things. <laughs> you know? And, um,. And then I, I, I somehow managed for about a year, and then they kind of started disappearing. So it, by 82, I was like, where are they? Where did they go? And, um, you know, I didn't know all the stories till later of all the infighting and all the other problems they were having by 1982. Yeah. But, you know, now I know, and I, but I have since got those issues and everything, so. <laughs> well, that, that baseball issue, Richie Rich Casper and Wendy yeah. in the National League in 1976. I don't know why that was so phenomenal. I guess because the story was so long. Yeah. And I read it, I've read it later as an adult and I've like, and I've just wondered why was this such a big deal? Mm -hmm. Because I, I don't think the story is so great. Mm -hmm. I think there were issues of Casper and Richie Rich that were, that were better. But uh, for some reason, and I'm not a I'm not a sports fan either. Although that year my sister was in little league, so we'd go to her games. And if there was any year that I was ever going to be interested in baseball, that would have been the year. Hmm. So that was sort of good. But as far as professional baseball, eh. although I did learn a lot from that comic, because the yeah. second half is just all about you know professional baseball. You know, you're you're not alone in that one. I mean, everybody would probably have a different story. As for me, I, I started collecting baseball cards about a year or two before, so I was heavy, heavy collecting baseball cards, too, when that issue came out. So I was just like, wow, you know, baseball. And, and I was kind of annoyed they never did an American League one. I didn't know the reasons behind that, but, <laughs> you know. And I was also annoyed that that was the only issue, you know, and it's like, mm, you know, but um, apparently they did plan to do some more sports related comics, but then that was about the time that uh, Alfred Harvey was kind of demoted in his own company and everything and, you know, things started to change. But, you know, as an outsider, you don't know what's going on, you know, it's like you just see certain comics and buy them and that's it. I don't know. <laughs> So, do, do you have a favorite Harvey comic? Um, it, well, Casper is my favorite character, and then yeah. uh, probably for the reason I told you, the Richie Rich and Casper is probably my favorite series because it's all original. I know Kramer, who's my favorite artist at Harvey, uh, drew it all, and all of them were written by Stan K. So, because of that, there's this consistency. Uh, with that one title where there's no consistency with any other titles. Maybe Richie Rich and Jackie Jokers is consistent with Ernie Cologne art, but I never cared for Jackie Jokers as much, so... I... I okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's your opinion of him? <laughs> no, 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 keep going. Tell me your favorite... What's, do you have a single favorite issue? Oh, of Richie Rich and Casper? Of, of, of any Harvey comic. Oh, of any Harvey comic, jeez. Well, it could be that uh, National League one. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. I know I, I, I really liked, but it's a reprint book, you know, just Richie Rich Zillions number three was the first one I saw that larger size, and then, you know, so I was just thrilled because it was so big, but, you know, stories don't, don't really uh, resonate well. Um, 
you know, for me, it's like Casper's stories, it, it, so it can't be a specific issue. I mean, because I probably saw it in the reprint issue, and I talk about it in my Best okay. of Harveyville Fun Times is what I consider the best Har- Casper stories ever, and that's after going yeah. through all of them. And, um, you know, it kind of depends on when you grew up. I mean... Uh, Jer- Absolutely. This is a subjective opinion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had this discussion with Jerry Beck one time, and he was saying, ah, there is no good Harvey comics that came out after 1964. And, and I said, Jerry, you're 10 years older than me. That totally makes sense, because I liked, uh, I don't think there's any good ones that really came out after, like, 1974, you know. It, it actually, it's a little later than that, but you know what I mean. It's like, yeah. uh you know, so it's like it is kind of what you grew up with, but uh, he wasn't reading any of those, so yeah, he thought, yeah, sixty four is where it kind of stops. Um, but I, I have since pointed out, you know, there's some good stories that were done later on. There's some wretched crap that came out later on too. But you know, <laughs> uh, let's see. So you know, the single stories, probably the Casper stories, probably the ones that I mentioned. Uh, in the book, like, As Easy as ABC, or whatever it's called, and, uh, uh, I can't, well, the, the, I can't even think of what it's called, I'll have to look in the book, but the one where they, it, oh, Invasion, that's probably my favorite Casper story, where, um, these, uh, creatures come from the planet Greedy, I may be making this up correct, incorrectly, but they, they're looking for a new source of energy because they've uh, depleted all the natural resources on their home planet. And uh-huh. they have this uncanny ability to replicate anybody and look like them except for sharp teeth. So, like, there's a Casper with sharp teeth and a Wendy right, with sharp teeth. Right, 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 yeah. And they proceed to eat the planet, eating trees and... <laughs> Strangely enough, they don't eat any animals, but hey, you know, so these are vegetarian greedies, and, um, uh, you know, I'll give away the story, you know, eventually Casper uses this rocket ship, which is commonplace in early 70s stories, and uh, they take it over, and uh, they go to the Milky Way thinking it's all filled with milk. And then they get out there, and then they eat the spaceship, so they have no way to go back. And then they realize Milky Way is just rocks, and right. so they're all disappointed. <laughs> yeah, but I love that story. <laughs> yeah. so. Yes, I remember. I read it as a kid. I've read it probably a couple other times since then. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that remind. It just reminds me of what the project I'm working on now. Mm-hmm. Um, Mike Wolfer is for the current Casper publications is um, writing a story uh, that I sort of encouraged him to do, Casper in Space. Because mm-hmm. uh, I've been drawing Casper for the past couple of years for American Mythology, and right. Mike Wolfer has been writing most of the scripts. Um, and he, every once in a while he say, well, is there a story that you think that you think you'd like to draw? And I'm like, well, you know, Casper used to go into space all the time, so why don't we do a Casper space story? Mm. And I, I get the feeling he, he wasn't vocally resistant to it, but I felt like he was a little bit resistant to it. Finally, they started, decided to publish a new Casper comic called Casper Spooksville. Yeah. And, and Mike says, well, we're going to do a, a multi-part story in this. And I go, okay, well, what about Casper in space? And he's like, okay, we'll do a Casper space story. What do you want to draw? <laughs> <laughs> I had to come up with some. I came up with some ideas that were sort of a loosely related plot, and he he did a lot of work to flesh it out and make it work. But a lot of I kept thinking, oh, have I read this before? Have they done this before? Is this too similar to what Casper's been through before? And like, yeah, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's going to be very reminiscent of what's happened before. But it all came through my subconscious. Mm-hmm. So and and you and you just said yeah that all the, the greedies like take on they can look like anybody and it's like oh jeez because that's part of the story oh so well, we'll see well there there is this I you know I've had troubles getting stuff published by American Mythology I mean I'll say it's partially my fault because I've stopped submitting things to them so they can't <laughs> accept anymore but uh, they did publish a Three Stooges story of mine and uh, an Ant and the Aardvark story of mine but. I wanted them to publish some Casper stories, and I actually gave them some thumbnail plot, you know, things. Yeah, yeah. 
and uh, springboard things. And uh, uh, they said, yeah, they, these are pretty good. And the, But they never got back to me about what they wanted to do or anything. And I think I wrote one of them out. But one of them was The Return of the Greedies. And, you know, I would love to see that one. You know, I, I'm more of the right, so maybe we should talk offline. Maybe I can s submit a script through you, and you can <laughs> have me write it. <laughs> yeah. Very possibly, yeah. I know, um, you know, they're not publishing as much, Casper. Right, yeah. They're, so I don't know what their, uh, what their, how much page count they have or how much extra material they need. I know that the Spooksville uh, title is full, and it's only a four-issue series, mm. and I don't know what's going on after after it comes out. Yeah. Um, then my only well, beef with them also is I just wish they'd just do, like, regular titles, one copy each, but I know they like to do the variant covers, and, you know, they like to put number one issues out, but, uh, you know, that's frustrating for someone like me trying to get all the books, because you see it, you see an issue, and you go, do I have this one, or do I not? I don't have this cover, but I don't remember this, you know, <laughs> it's like... <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I have nothing to do about, do yeah. with that. I, yeah. you know, if they ask me for a cover, sure, yeah. you're going to pay me, I'll draw it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to do it, yeah. but I have no, let's say, in the, uh, yeah. the, the policy of multiple variant covers. And right. And then people ask me all the time, why can't they publish Richie Rich? And it's like, I know it's tied up in some other situation right now, which is, you know, because it's not like it was in the old days where all the Harvey comics, all the characters were owned. You know, they've done this with Marvel, too. You know, it's like they don't license out all the characters together, lock, stock, and barrel. They lock right. license out certain sets of characters. So I know American mythology has the rights to the Casper, Spooky, Wendy, Hot Stuff, and blah, blah, but they don't to Richie and Lada and Dot and da, 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 da. And I think those are with DreamWorks right now. Now, they could do a comic book on that, but I think that's a whole different agreement that you'd have to do, like, a you know, a Harvey Girls Forever comic book, which... I wouldn't mind seeing. <laughs> so, yeah, but sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Richie Rich was coming out from some other publisher. Dan Parent was doing it. Yeah. Um, but I don't know what the rights situation is on that. All I know is that DreamWorks DreamWorks owns Casper, and they've licensed Casper and all the magic characters, mm. the magical Harvey characters, to a. American mythology, so that's why I can draw them all. And um, I don't know what the situation is on any of the others whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. And but I know that, that one issue that Dan Parent, even though there's covers to two, three, and four, they never issued anything else. <laughs> I assume they didn't sell very well. The, yeah. the, the first one didn't sell well. I just don't know. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't. It didn't look completely traditional. Yeah. So I don't know whether that was a problem. I mean. I don't know what the problem uh, with the Casper stuff. We're going totally traditional. Uh, yeah. The total feel. The stories have to be have to have that certain feel. The artwork has to look be really on model. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm per I'm perfectly happy with that since that's the way I prefer to see it. But yeah. I don't know whether that is a problem as far as sales or reaching a new audience. I don't really know who American mythology sees their audience as. They're doing some reprints. Yeah. Uh, some of the reprints I've the reprinted material I've seen doesn't look that great. It looks like they're just photostatting it out of the original, scanning it out of the original books. Right. Um. So I don't think that's very good for a nostalgia audience. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I wish they put out like compilations separately. They did one Casper one. Yeah, they did. Uh, like Casper Classics or something like that. And then I think they should do more of those, but separate. You know, do the reprints in one book and do the new ones in, in a separate book. But also just continue the numbering. I mean, Spooksville is the title. Continue on with that. You know, it's like, because it is frustrating, you know, as a collector to, to know if I have everything, which I don't know if I have everything, so I have to look it up every so often. Uh, <laughs> 
and I don't like to buy the multiple covers, but I end up doing so because I go, ooh, that cover's pretty neat. Ooh, I like that one. You know, it's like, you know. Yep. Well, that's the, that's the point. Yeah. And it's like, wow, instead of having five covers, why can't you have five different books out? You know, it's like, what? You know, but I get it. I know. It's not 1972. I, you know, it's like. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I I, I assume that the books don't sell well enough, and that's why they are trying all these different strategies and keep canceling things and keep bringing out new titles and only bring out one issue and then bring out another new issue. Um, I don't see them. I, I don't go to comic stores that much, but I don't really see them accessible in comic stores much either. Yeah. Um, I did buy one of my issues in a comic store, but yeah. when I asked about the next one, they, the comic store didn't carry that title. So. Yeah. Well, it's it's inconsistent. There, it seems like there's two types of comic stores that I've seen in recent years. Uh, there's and there's more of the latter, uh, there, uh, which I'll say in a second. Is there's the comic stores that carry a little bit of everything, you know, including the American mythology books and blah blah. Like my friend Lee who runs Lee's Comics. This is, uh, he carries a little bit of everything. He has a kids section. So anytime I go to his shop, yeah, I'll see American mythology books. It won't be just the Casper ones. It'll be like Underdog and Rocky and Bullwinkle and all the other ones that they're putting out, stuff like that. So when I'm in his shop, I usually buy a stack of about 10 of them because that's where they are. Uh, otherwise, I buy things off of eBay. But unfortunately, I think there's more comic stores like this that if it ain't a Marvel or DC, we're not carrying it, you know, and it's like... That's really frustrating, you know. Yeah, I don't even go in those comic stores. <laughs> yeah, but like I said, there's more stores like that yeah. than the yeah. other, and or even worse, it it calls itself a, a comic store, and really they have like, you know, hundreds of the Funko Pops or toys or games or anything but actual comic books. Yeah, and the if they do have comic books, it's like you know, Marvel Masterworks books or something like that that, you know, has a longer shelf life, but not the monthly books anymore. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, I don't know if it's a problem with the way comic conventions have been going. Yeah. And that's just spread to comic stores because comic conventions, there's so much more stuff. Yeah. Than, than just comics. Now, I did go to a comic convention in Berkeley... Uh, I, I helped my friend Lee that I just said work, work it and uh, they actually did bring uh, somebody brought this actually specifically for me because I'm collecting these but I couldn't afford to buy all of them but he had like two long boxes of all those DC humor ones that they used to do like Peter Pork Chops and <laughs> you know Fox and the Crow and uh, Real Screen Funnies and all that and I was just like salivating I want to buy all these you know. Uh -huh. but you know it's like I, I bought a few, but, you know, certainly not as many as he had. He probably had about 200 books. And I'm like, geez, you know, it's like somebody must have collected all of them and they just dumped them on this guy. And he knew that I would want to buy them, but I'm not going to buy $200. Well, they weren't a dollar each. They were like at least $10 each for the most part. Oh, you know, yeah. so, you know, so I, I bought about four or five of them and, you know, still spent about 30 bucks. So it's like, you know. But anyway. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I, I still, you know, I scour, whenever I travel, I would go into junk shops and scour them for Harveys yeah. and other things, too. Um, but I won't usually buy things if they're more than two bucks, because, yeah. like, it's just not worth it to me. Yeah, but I found that the prices on Harveys has really gone up in recent times. I don't know, because I don't buy them anymore, but, like, I have a friend of mine who wants me to sell them his sad sacks. They sell, they sell him my sad sack collection and you know I go why and you know he let the cat out of the bag he says well you know anytime I look for sad sack it's always like 10 15 bucks each and I go really you know it's like when I got them they were like quarter bin stuff you could get a ton of them that way yeah. but um, you know I guess you know if it's out of you know print long enough people will be going for the back issues more than anything so and Sad Sack has this kind of bizarre appeal, you know, even now when there's no real, you know, publicity for it. You know, I don't know. I don't get it. But I, I always like Sad Sack. But, I, you know, it's like, you know, when it's not published, you'd think people would forget about it. But apparently they don't. I don't know. So. <laughs> I don't know. 
I don't know what drives people's interests. Everyone's different. We all are, have our uh, own peculiarities. <laughs> um, as a kid, I didn't ever want to read Sad Sack. I didn't like the covers. <laughs> the covers were always incredibly busy. Yeah. Those George, original George Baker art covers, they were so busy, and I didn't want to read them. Yeah. Um, after a while, you know, you go to the, I would go to the 7-Eleven, and there wouldn't be anything new to buy for, in Harvey Comics, or uh, anything that looked interesting in Disney Comics, so I'd like end up with a sad sack, because that was all there was <laughs> at that, that week. And the, once I actually bought a couple, they weren't bad. And as an adult, though, I'm like, oh, this is, these stories, they're pretty well constructed. Yeah. The sad sack stories are really pretty good. <laughs> Um, that might be the thing, you know, people have nostalgia for it, and then they're like you, they go, wow, these are real, really well written. Although I can say that about other Harvey comics, too, except for the ones we're ragging on like Bunny or something. But <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, but, uh, I don't know, as an adult, I find it really hard to read Richie Rich. Yeah. I do too. <laughs> and I, I, I will I will drop the I will drop the bomb, yes. It's because of Trump it didn't help. Anyway, but we'll go back <laughs> But uh, yeah, but Richie, Richie, Richie Rich about. was never my favorite character, even as a kid. I mean it's like I thought, wow, that's kinda neat being the richest kid in the world. But you know, I always like the more fantasy elements, so that's why I would like Richie Rich and Casper because it was basically they put Richie in the fantasy world, and so I'm like, hey, cool, you know. Yeah. And it's like I wanted more Enchanted Forest, you know. That's really what yeah. I wanted, and so you know, like I love the Casper Cub Scout issues. I don't know if you read any of those. Yeah. But, you know, there Richie and Casper teamed up again, and Richie gets lost in the woods or something at some point, and then, you know, they meet up with Hot Stuff and Spooky all sporting uh, Cub Scout caps and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and then some big green marshmallow monster or something, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> and uh, those, I thought, were, at the time, in the League of the, the National League issue, too. You know, and... Um, uh, they did Whenever Wendy. The, well, yeah. They did Wendy Campfire Girl ones too, and things like that. So, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I love the crossover issues whenever they would all team up. Mm -hmm. um, and hot stuff never used to be in Casper comics, right. even though you like gotta wonder why. Like, how come these characters never met? They were in supposedly the same environment all the time. Yeah. But then once in a while, you know, Casper would, sh I mean, the hot stuff would show up. There was an issue of Richard Rich and Casper where hot stuff had his horn stuck in a balloon. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that was the first time hot stuff had shown up in that title. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just remember reading that and it was just, I thought that was so great. Yeah. <laughs> All well, the, you know, the characters that never showed up together, finally showing up together. I mean, right. whatever I was yeah, I think the original reason they didn't is because they were all kind of in their own uh, worlds for copyright reasons, you know, and it's kind of funny they separate them out now, but, um, like, all those ones, like Casper, Little Audrey, Baby Huey, Herman and Catnip, all those, those were the original, you know, famous studio's Paramount characters, so those were kind of kept off to the side, and they didn't team them up very much, and then Richie Rich, Lotta Dot, and uh, well, not Audrey. Audrey was over there, but Richie Rich, Little Dot, and Lotta were created by the Harvey people. Um, but then Hot Stuff was created by the Harvey people, but they had different copyrights on it. Like one was Harvey Comics, this one was Harvey Publications. You, know, you look at the old ones; they have different copyrights on it of who owned what, and I don't know why there was such a division. But um, yeah, later on they kind of broke down those barriers quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, maybe it was just continuity. They didn't want to put in... It was just a perception, like public perception. They didn't want to confuse kids, so they just kept every character pretty separate from the others. But then, you know, Spooky and Wendy and Casper would always rotate through each other's comics. Yeah. 
So American mythology finally got it right. You have hot stuff with him, and he should have been there all along. So I don't know. <laughs> but I, I think the original reason was for copyrights reasons or something, or uh, probably certain issues sold better than others, or there's a fear that hot stuff's the devil, and if he's in this Casper issue, now we can't reprint it because you know people are going to get up in arms or whatever. So yeah. You know, I don't know. That part I don't know. And there's no one alive that would, you know, be able to tell me at this point, you know. So, right, right. Yeah. Um, um, I loved Richie Rich as a kid, and it was always the adventure stories yeah. that grabbed me more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't think I had a real, real uh, specific story that. I can think of that was like this was the best Richie Rich story yeah. but it was always the adventure stories right um, uh, oh back to Jackie Jokers uh, yes <laughs> oh I can I say that I hated Jackie Jokers you can say it <laughs> oh god I hated Jackie Jokers <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> maybe because he was always just so he always seemed so insincere <laughs> And his, his comics were always full of these bad jokes that just didn't seem funny to me. He just never seemed funny. And he was always, like, presented as this incredibly funny guy who everybody loved. And I, just, I, uh, I thought he was boring and awful and I don't know, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> that's my rant against Jackie Jokers. <laughs> my sister used to buy Richie Rich and Jackie Jokers, and I would read them. Yeah. And I would wanted them to be funny, especially the the movie parodies. Yeah. But you know, I was buying Mad Magazine at the same time too. At at some point, I didn't buy them when I was really little, but at some point I started buying them. And uh, they were not uh, obviously couldn't hold the candle to Mad Magazine, but <laughs> oh, they were terrible. I thought. Sorry. <laughs> I, I assume that Ernie Cologne wrote them and drew drew them all. Well, but. he didn't write them. For the most part, uh, it was Lenny. He didn't because I feel like every time he drew, the atmosphere of the story was a specific thing, and it wasn't just his artwork; it was also the uh, the script. Yeah. That he had, he had the, the stories that he drew. The script had a certain style too that you could feel, even though you never knew who was drawing or writing these things. Yeah, actually, the, the writer of all those was Lenny Herman. And he and uh, Ernie were very close. In fact, uh, do you remember Crazy Magazine, which was Marvel's version yeah. of Mad yeah. Magazine? They did a couple uh, Mad Magazine-type, you know, movie parodies over there. And then and Ernie drew them and Lenny wrote them. And, you know, they kind of look like Drucker parodies in Mad. You know, they did a King Kong one and I think a Welcome Back Cotter one. So they were trying to... I think use that as a springboard to get out of there because Ernie always was trying to get out of Harvey. <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, yeah, Lenny um, he he wrote most of the humorous stuff. Now the adventure Richies that uh, Ernie did, a uh, different guy did those. I think it's Ralph Newman, but I have to look it up. Some things I don't have in my head. People go. You don't have this in your head, and it's like, no, that's why I wrote a book so I could look it up. But, <laughs> but Lenny Herman, I uh, I remember well because he was doing when they moved on to the Harvey people moved on to Star in the yeah. early eighties. Uh, he yeah. wrote the like, Planet Terry and Royal Roy and uh, Top Dog, uh-huh. and then he passed away all of a sudden on the handball court. So that was the end. Uh, but that's where I found out who this guy was. And they said, yeah, he wrote all the the lame pun jokes that Jackie Jokers would tell and stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes they attribute Jackie Jokers to Lenny Herman's as his creation, but I don't think he created it. I think he just wrote it. But mm-hmm. anyway. <laughs> but that's the guy to blame. So... <laughs> <laughs> but Lenny Herman also did gag cartoons for uh, magazines over the years. I mean, he did a lot of stuff. So you know, but you know, yeah, he 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 was one of those guys that relied on puns and lame jokes and stuff like that. So, um, 
Somebody said this once, and I think it was on in the Facebook group. They said, if you look at Jackie Jokers as the world's worst comedian, then he starts to make sense. (laughs) (laughs) A comedian that thinks he's really funny and isn't, you know, I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, well, yeah, but everybody and all the other characters loved him. Yeah. Oh, no. (laughs) I mean, I couldn't, as a child, I couldn't really put it into words. I couldn't analyze it too deeply i just didn't like it i just knew i didn't like it right <laughs> i i remember though the first time i saw jackie jokers it was again in those issues that we bought when we went to hawaii in 73 you know jackie joker started as his own title he wasn't teamed up yeah. with richie originally yeah. and uh there was an ad one of those little strip ads that they're this at the bottom of the page and it says you know Meet Jackie Jokers. He's the world's funniest comedian, and da 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 da. And how funny he was! And so I was like, "Ooh, I want to find this one. He must be really funny." You know, I was fooled by the advertising. And then I finally did find an issue when it was Richie Rich and Jackie Jokers a few years later, and I was like, "This is it. <laughs> yeah, this is why he's funny. You know, there's yeah. funnier stuff than Mad. Like I said, you know, it's like, mm, you know, but uh, yeah. It, no, no, I I actually bought one of the. Jackie Joker's tight issues when he was in his own title. Mm-hmm. It wasn't issue, it wasn't issue one, I don't think. Yeah, um, it was a later issue. But that was like I knew right then. No, I don't like this. <laughs> well, there's only, yeah, there's only four issues, and then you know they realize oh this isn't selling, and so I'm sure they figured hey Richie Rich is selling, let's throw him in here. You know, uh, I'm sure it wasn't any more thought than that, and somehow. That worked because Richie Rich and Jackie Jokers lasted uh, from 73 to 82 or something like that, which is a pretty decent run for kind of a lame title. (laughs) (laughs) Well, my sister liked them. (laughs) I don't know. Uh, Okay. (laughs) But uh, but, uh, I I did like the, if I liked anything out of it, to say a positive thing, I I did like their attempts at doing a, a TV or movie parody. And some of them yeah. actually did come off pretty well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Those, are, those were the most those were the most interesting stories in every issue. Yeah, I just didn't, they were they still weren't good enough. <laughs> <laughs> picky, picky, picky. You know? So, what is your thought of Richie Rich and Billy Bellhops? Then did you, <laughs> I, <laughs> did you ever see that one? <laughs> yes, I knew that came out. I'm not sure. I sur- I didn't read it as a kid. Now I'm trying to think. Did I ever like run across an issue later? Because there's only one issue. I mean, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I did read. tell you i have read the richie rich meets adam awards story but uh adam harvey owns it so (laughs) uh it probably won't see publication very soon you know if ever you know so but there was a real story not just that little strip at the bottom that says we're awarding you adam awards for you know he helps people or whatever you know it's like you know so all all the harvey sons were allowed to create their own character and uh, Russell Harvey's was Billy Bellhops, and uh, Alan Harvey's was this character named Comics Kid, which he did print in an Ashcan edition years later when they were doing Lauren Harvey, so I've seen that story. And then there's the Adam Award story by Adam Harvey. And then I've never, and I've asked him, but I don't think Eric Harvey created a character. I think he was too young or something, because he's never confessed (laughs) or maybe he's too embarrassed to say that (laughs) but I I think um, the one Timmy Time that one actually was an Ernie Cologne creation although he created his Mark Time which I thought was a better name (laughs) since (laughs) but uh, Alfred Harvey apparently wanted it alliterative and that's how he became Timmy Time but um yeah, they, they were making some weird, weird attempts at new characters there at the late 70s, but nothing really took off. <laughs> you know? Right, well, yeah. from what I can tell, none of it was very good. <laughs> but maybe, I don't know. By that time I was sort of, I was transitioning to DC Comics. Yeah, 
I, w- I always wonder what would have happened had they kept going, you know, and not stopped. Because I mean, the Richie Rich thing would have had to have imploded eventually, I would think. But well, the whole market changed. Yeah. I I had always assumed that the reason that Harvey basically disappeared was that was that everything changed to direct market. Yeah. There was no children's market anymore. Yeah. Well, I, I think it was just the timing of all that. that. I mean, that happened, yes, but also all the infighting and everything all happened yeah. at the same time. But it is true what you're saying because, you know, very shortly thereafter, Charlton went away and uh, Gold Key went away. I guess it was Whitman by that point, but, you know, and, you know, certain titles, the more kid like titles of Marvel and DC all went away. So. That was like the beginning of superheroes or nothing, you know, which kind of frustrated yeah. me because although I like superheroes, I've never been enamored with superheroes. And I don't know if it's because I was thinking about that today. It's like you asked me what the first comic books I ever read. And in in that batch, there was a Mighty Thor, like number 141 or something like that. 140, 141, I can't remember. It has some, The Growing Man or something was, you know, so if you ever look up the issue. And I remember reading that as a little kid, and I thought it was dull, dull, dull. I didn't mind the artwork, but I just thought it was dull, dull, dull. And I think Stan, Stan Lee wrote it. But, you know, yeah, no, well, they were, as it, that, you weren't the market for that. Stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, and then I'd watch stuff, you know, people laugh at me like this, and it's like I'd watch, like, Super Friends on TV with Wendy Marvin and Wonder Dog and later the Wonder Twins, and I said, I, and then I'd watch Batman with Adam West, and I, you know, I go, that's what's missing. I like the funny, you know, and it's like I always like funny superheroes. So even to this day when they do, like, the new movies, if it's, like, one of those newer DC movies where it's all dreadfully dull and dark and dreary and ugh, I hate those, but if it's like a lighter thing like Guardians of the Galaxy, I'm going, I'm there. That's funny. I like that. <laughs> so I was always attracted to the humor. I don't know about in your case, but... <laughs> well, it's sort of similar. It's not, I don't think it's necessarily the humor for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, as a kid, every once in a while, I'd be confronted with a DC or a Marvel comic, and they would be incredibly boring, especially Marvel. They were so overwritten. My sister, <laughs> my sister, like, put the, her finger on it. She goes, oh, there's too many words. <laughs> and I'm like, you're absolutely right. <laughs> These are so overwritten, so yeah. badly overwritten. As, and so, you know, but then... When I became, you know, like 13, 14, 15, it's like, oh, these are so good. Yeah. And I was like total, after a while, I mean, as a teenager, I was so totally into X-Men. Yeah. Um, I discovered X-Men. Well, I was reading, I, you know, I was reading, I was total dyed in the wool Harvey fan for a while. Mm-hmm. And then I went through an Archie period. <laughs> but while I was still reading Harvey comics, Shazam was coming out. I love Shazam. Mm-hmm. Captain the Marvel, yeah. the Marvel family. I just love, love, love them. Um, as much as I love the Harvey comics. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually dropped Shazam for a while after they would only be doing new stories. Mm-hmm. When they started re- re- trying to replicate the TV show, and it was Billy and um, Uncle Dudley traveling around in a van, <laughs> just like on the TV show, yeah. I dropped it because yeah. they were not very good. Yeah. Although I went back, I, I went back and rebought them all yeah. um, later. Um, but that was my transition into uh, DC, and then I just as it was my favorite for a couple of years. I just love those. And then I discovered X-Men, and that was my favorite for a while. Yeah. Uh, and I dropped, basically dropped Harvey Comics around, you know, 77, 78. Mm-hmm. Although, as I said, Richard and Casper, I would every once in a while, I would buy one of those. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I could not, you know, pass up an Uncle Scrooge, which had a Carl Bark story in it. Yeah. So I always had to buy those. Yeah. Um, but every other Disney comic I basically dropped. <laughs> So, but, yeah. so, so yeah. I was in the absolute target audience for those Marvel comics, those yeah. badly 
completely overwritten, you know, Chris Claremont. <laughs> but you know, like hundreds yeah. Well, I read those blue. too. I mean, I you know, I I actually you know, I say I didn't like superheroes, but I did read. Uh, here's the ones I read regularly. I read Superman. I read because uh, I figured I had to read at least one DC comic, and I, had, I like Marvel better. So I read Superman. I didn't care for Batman because I wanted my Batman to be funny, and so he, that was a hard one to do. But yeah. occasionally, if Neil Adams did one, I'd buy it. And then uh, on the other end, on Marvel, I bought Amazing Spider-Man. I bought Fantastic Four. And then I did, like everyone else, get into X-Men for a while. And what got me off of reading um, Marvel comics, at least, eventually, is when, you know, if you didn't get the issue that month, it was suddenly, you know, what comics were 50 cents then. It it was suddenly $2 the next month because, oh, you didn't get it. You should have a subscription. It's like, I don't want it. It's that hard to find. And then it's like this story is continued in Incredible Hulk three twenty six. Well, I don't want to read Incredible Hulk. I like reading <laughs> X Men. And so those two things really soured me on. Re- and then they did like the uh, Marvel um, Secret Wars, and that you know for uh, some people, and forgive me, Marvel fans, you know, some people are like that was when I started. You know, it was the greatest thing ever. I thought it was. Ugh. You know, cheap shot against the crisis, which I love the crisis on Infinite Earths on the DC side. And, uh-huh. you know, but when Marvel did it with the Secret Wars, I said, I'm out of here, I'm done. So that pretty much ended my Marvel reading. And then DC kind of went down the tubes later on, too, post crisis. And I don't know when I stopped reading them. And so I just stopped reading all of them and just said, eh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I'll I, I'll I'll I read older stuff. Earlier. I'll read older stuff if I find stuff from the fifties, sixties, seventies, whatever. Yeah, I'll read some of that. Sometimes sure. even eighties. But you know, it's like, you know, those are the things that kind of threw me off because of all the continuity and everything like that. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, one of the reasons, yeah, one of the reasons that I resisted reading uh, DC comics was because they were continued and you could never count on getting the whole story. Yeah. It was so frustrating. Mm-hmm. Um, once in a while, you know, I was remember this one store where they wouldn't turn them over. They wouldn't turn them over on the stacks. They would just, you know, restock comics mm-hmm. and so you could find several months worth of comics at the same time and I would buy. Mm-hmm. If I could put together a complete story of, like, say, ju- the Justice League issue, then I would buy a few at a time. Right. So I could read the entire story. But otherwise, it's like, no, I, I, I never know whether I'll be able to find the whole thing. So I'm not, I'm not interested in spending my money on that. Yeah. Um, but I guess I stopped reading X Men when John Romita Jr. started drawing it because it didn't look right to me. And the, mm-hmm. and I, I the story, the writing had gone down, mm-hmm. I thought, by that time anyway, even though Chris Claremont was still writing it. I just didn't like it anymore. Yeah, I've um, heard that. And I basically stopped reading all... Uh, I was in sort of my, my snooty period. Uh, <laughs> that I'm above this sort of thing. Um, I was going to the Cubert School, and there was this sort of... <laughs> you know... what I started buying too you're right it's like the black and white titles you know and there's some good stuff some bad stuff but you know I I bought a lot of that stuff when it came out (laughs) yeah and Pacific Comics was doing all this stuff they started what right at the beginning of the direct market Pacific Comics was starting I didn't I wasn't in early enough to get like uh, Captain Victory number one Mm -hmm. but that's when I went to the Cubert School and uh, everybody else was reading this stuff and I was like I was reading th- look, seeing stuff and people were going this is really good and I was so there was a lot of this interesting stuff coming out um, and we were like oh, you're still reading X-Men oh. <laughs> so I stopped reading X-Men at that. I finally stopped reading X-Men and all most Marvel comics um, I stopped reading DC pretty much flat when Crisis started because I'm just like okay they're going to change everything I'm out fine yeah. I don't need I don't need this stuff anymore. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of funny how those things work. They either 
uh, that's a good ending point for some people, or it's a good starting point for some people, you know? Sure. And sure. Oh, I was in this comic store, and I don't know what issue came out, but it was it was a Friday, and that's when new comics were still on Friday. And uh, all these people were lined up at the register, like, oh, you're going to get this, going to get this, and some woman hurt. Somebody said to me, so you're going to buy this issue? And I'm like, no, why would I care? They're going to change this character that I liked into something new. I don't care anymore. Mm-hmm. And this woman in line turned to me and go, oh, she says, oh, that's so mean. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I didn't say anything, but I just like, boy, what a weird thing. What a, That really shows what your, uh, what your mindset is, lady. You know, no, I'm not being mean. I think if anybody's being mean, it's these people changing this character that they've presented in this certain way and then, like, totally revamping it so that it's not the same character anymore, although it's still called the same thing. Right. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. I, I, uh, oh, that's some pet peeve I have. I don't remember that woman. <laughs> woman. <laughs> calling, me, calling me mean. <laughs> because I didn't want to read some comic book. Oh, well. And now that woman runs DC. Ca- no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we've been talking over an hour here. I don't know. What do you, do you have any other Harvey or anything else you want to bring up or anything? Or? Harvey, well, I've told you this before, but it, it's not recorded for posterity. Okay. So, uh, what can I say that's like would be valuable to anybody? Um, you know, who's interested in Harvey? <laughs> I uh, Stan K. Stan K. was my instructor at the Cubert School as well as High Eisman. Um, he told me that he wrote every issue of Rich, Rich, and Casper. I was so fascinated because um, um, that had been my favorite, you know, Harvey comic. That had st- I was still occasionally was interested in it. Um, he brought in his layouts. He wrote the scripts as layouts. He didn't mm. write just words. He, he did layouts for the script, and um, he brought in the issue of Rich, Rich, and Casper where it snows so much that um, on the cover, it's like the Statue of Liberty's hand is sticking out of the snow. I remember that, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, in your, uh, your uh, in Harveyville Fun Times, you say that's one of the worst issues. <laughs> uh, but, and, and, hey, I'm not judging. Although I didn't, but, uh, it, I, I will wait, tell wait, you wait. the truth, on the reviews of Richie Rich and Casper, uh, that's uh, my friend who's also passed away, I hate to say, uh, Chris Barat, who, uh, he was very harsh on his opinions on things, but he was good. He was very thorough on things, he knew his uh-huh. stuff, so it was hard to criticize occasionally we get in arguments about stuff getting in arguments about harvey stuff is kind of silly but you know we would you know it's like how dare you say that this is an awful <laughs> issue you know it's one of my favorites or something you know and it's like but i'd publish it because sure. it's hit it was his column and he loved the richie rich stuff he adored sure, it and you know? i don't i don't have any problem with him yeah. telling, saying that that issue is yeah. one of the worst that's fine yeah. Yeah. It, i i i it has a special place in my heart because that's the issue that Stan brought in ah. really out for. I mean, he was working on the story in class while oh. we were all working wow. at our desks. So um, that means something to me. <laughs> um, what he he told a story in class about how right after the Hubert School started, um, he would, you know he was an instructor there. This was before I was there, he, and he was talking to somebody, one of the students who had been a Harvey fan, and. Um, they were, this person had mentioned a story and Stan had written it and he confirmed, yeah, he was the writer of that story. And then, then he was thinking, wait, but you're too young to have read that story. How did you read that story? And that was the first time it had come to his attention that Harvey was reprinting mm. all this work and hadn't told any of the creators. And uh. of course, royalties were unheard of in yeah. comics at that time. Yeah. So um, they weren't paying them anything and they hadn't even told them. Yeah. Or at least they hadn't told Stan. Stan was not aware of it until some Cuber school student made it clear to him. Um, and yeah, because yeah, Harvey was doing the digest back then. That's where they reprinted a lot of stuff, you know. Well, this is this is you know they were reprinting stuff in the early seventies. Oh, I they did that it. too. I mean, they reprinted no, stuff. I'm sure that's a, what they were. Ta- I'm sure that's yeah. what Stan was talking about. Yeah. That's true too. You know, it's like, and uh, yes, they reprinted a lot of stuff then too, especially when they expanded the lines. Um, 
you know, one thing I noticed, I don't know if you ever did, I, I, um, one of the issues I bought, actually my sister bought it, but I ended up with it, um, don't tell her, uh, <laughs> is uh, R- Richie Rich Fortunes. And I believe it was number 18. We bought I, we bought it in the hospital. I think my grandmother was in the hospital for some reason. And we went to visit her. And in the gift shop they had Harvey Comics. And my sister bought it. And uh, I looked at it. And it's like, why is this story drawn so much better? I didn't tell anybody. I just thought it. You know, why is this issue drawn so much better? And it's because it reprinted some story that probably originally appeared about 10 years earlier. And... Uh, it might have been Ernie Cologne, but Ernie Cologne in the early 60s tended to, it, it had more to do with, and this was with Archie and other publishers, you know, they tended to use brushes more often in the early 60s and before, and then by the 70s they tended to use pens. Now, I didn't know this was the reason back then. Yeah. I just noticed, wow, this is, I like how this is drawn better, you know, and it's probably because of the ink line more than anything else. Um, and, uh, you know, knowing it now, you know, but, uh, you know, I didn't know it was a reprint until years later when I was starting to collect the older issues and I found the original issue from 62 or something like that. I go, wait a minute, you know, this, oh, wow, okay. So these issues are reprints too. So, you know, it's like I, I just thought, you know, they had different artists and different titles. No, it was reprints yeah. so, on the regular yeah. issues, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> So absolutely, and uh, you know it, it's kind of a shame that uh, you know everybody always asks me this. They say, "Well, I wish they'd go back to Richie Rich number one and start reprinting it in order." Da 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 da. da. You know, and it's like I do too. But I mean, it, you know, it's like it's not one company, you know, anymore. So, you know, somebody has to make heads or tails of it, and then somebody has to license it out, and then somebody want, has to agree to pay the license, and, you know, all sorts someone of... To, someone has to figure out a marketing plan, because I don't know how yeah. you, I get to market this stuff. Yeah, and then people always... The will buy it these days. People always throw it in my face, well, Archie does it, and uh, Marvel and DC do it, and I go, yeah, because they're still owned by themselves. They they didn't sell out to another company. They're still their own thing, you know? Yeah. You know, uh, Harvey was thrown in with classic media, I guess, and now it's DreamWorks and stuff like that, but they don't know what they own, you know, and they're just licensing things out. They don't know. And I used to, when it was classic media, I used to be in touch with people and kind of work with them now. Um, like, I don't know if you know the guy Rick Goldschmidt. Uh, he's a Rankin Bass historian. I interviewed him recently. And he has to deal with the same channels uh, for his, those characters, the Rudolph and the Frosty and all that stuff. And he used to have contacts there. And now he's frustrated, too, because he doesn't know who to talk to, you know, to say, why don't you put out this? Why don't you do this? You know, da da da, da you know. Right. And, um... They don't even know they ha- own the stuff. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, I, you know, and when these things get purchased, you know, it goes from the Harvey family to this owner, to this owner, to this owner, you know, things get lost, misplaced, disorganized, thrown away, whatever. And... <laughs> Here we are, <laughs> you know, so, you know, you know, I always tell people, just buy old issues on eBay, I guess that's the best you can do, that's what I did, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's still all out there, Yeah, you can read it if you want, and um, unless you're going for Richie Rich number one, which has been reprinted a few times, uh, most of them are generally affordable, I believe, still, unless you get the really early ones or something, but, yeah, 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 you know, but. It's like the only continuity would be, 
if you pick up like an early issue of Richie Rich or something, you know, Cadbury. Cad, Cadbury might be Jeeves or something else, yeah. Yeah. or you won't have Irona in it or something because you know they didn't create that character yet or made a money or something like that. But I mean, <laughs> or Nurse Jenny has black hair, not red curly right. hair. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And she's slimmed down sometimes and then sometimes really heavy yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, but hey. Or, or um, Norman Gnome in Casper is like, what did he actually look like? Because every time that character appears, or maybe they're all named Norman, like yes. G, or something like that. Yes. <laughs> or Norm Gnome. There's always like, what does the character look like? He's always different. <laughs> There was some other character that was that way, and I was... Uh, oh, I know what it was. It's nothing to do with uh, Harvey. Um, but, uh, you know, the world of Commander McBrag, you know, his anybody he talked to all had the same voice, but he was drawn differently each time, his disinterested friend, you know, so it was like that. You know, really, really, Commander, I must be going. And it was the same voice every time. You know? it was probably the same recording, even, but they drew him differently, like he had all these different friends. But anyway, yeah. so that's like Norm Gnome, I guess. I don't know. But even... Um, well, we mentioned Irona and Nurse Jenny, but even like, um, oh, they redesigned a few characters until they got to their final, you know, um, like even... Made of Money. Yeah. Made of Money is their first, her first appearance looks so different. I mean, not really, really different, but is very different oh. than she finally ended up being. Well, I know one that's really different is, uh, and they didn't really publish this, although they published a cover sample. Uh, we were talking about Jackie Jokers. Originally, it was kind of supposed to look like Harpo Marx with big blonde hair, yeah, curly hair, and uh, it was supposed to be for a revived Harvey Hits series, which never happened. And then, I guess they retooled it, and they thought you know having black greasy hair was better. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> well, I always thought he was kind of a take on Jerry Lewis or something, you know. It's like, you know, oh, you know, at the t- Jack Jokers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, when are you bringing Jackie Jokers back over at American Mythology? I want the Casper uh, meets Jackie yeah. Jokers story. I'm going to start writing I should, it. I, I should sneak him into the background sometime and see if, <laughs> <laughs> see if that flies. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. And Casper says, oh, "Who are you? What are you, little boy?" Well, I used to write and tell jokes, but I've fallen on hard times. <laughs> and just leave it at that, you know. Don't even say who it is, you know. <laughs> just... uh-huh. Oh no, God, I can't, I can't, I can't risk getting anybody in trouble. <laughs> the Jackie Joker's cameo. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I can't uh. risk that. That would be so funny, but no, I, 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 I can't risk doing anything. <laughs> that would get anybody in trouble with DreamWorks. That's fun to think about, though. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. No, I would love to do that. <laughs> uh, well, they are bringing Richie Rich back to that Harvey... I don't know if you've seen that show on uh, Netflix. It's It was originally called Harvey Street Kids, and then they renamed it Harvey Girls Forever. And it's kind of a quirky version uh, with Dot, Lada, and Audrey. And now they're bringing yeah. in Richie Rich. And, you know, it's totally off-model and uh, kind of a strange show. I mean, some people just hate it for that because it's so different. It's like what you were talking about. They're changing my characters. I won't watch it. I won't read it. I won't buy it. Um but I gave it a chance because, hey, it's just on Netflix. It's there anyway. And uh, the first season is just really weird, and there's some funny ones. And then the second season, I thought, actually was pretty funny. But, you know, what I find funny about it was just kind of like, you know, the weird storylines they get into. But it's not really funny in a Harvey sort of way. So, you know, I don't know if it would be your cup of tea if you ever watched it, but anyway, I'm not necessarily recommending it either, but that's what they're sure. doing on the other end, you know. Sure. I, I haven't watched it. I was aware of it. Yeah. Um, I didn't know they were bringing Richie Rich, unless you mentioned it to me, and I promptly forgot. Um, that's, uh, like, really but, new information. In fact, I don't think they've released oh, those okay. episodes yet. I think they come out next month or something like that. Yeah. I, I, don't have a pro- I don't have problems with re-envisioning characters as long as it's done well. Yeah. And if it's done well, then I applaud it. If it's done badly, I'm like, God, why? Yeah. Um, but I, I am, as far as me, as far as for myself, uh, this stuff is mostly a nostalgic thing, kick for 
me. Yeah. So I'm not that interested in new material. Uh, you know, if someone sits me down in front of it to watch it and it's really well done, I'll be like, yeah, that's good. Good. Yeah, thanks. I was glad for that experience, but I'm not going to probably seek it out. Yeah. And, you know, the way the Harvey people did it, most of the things, the way they did it, actually are probably the best way. I mean, I think they improved on Casper by creating the Enchanted Forest. And instead of just leaving him, you know, to the it's a good, good, good ghost type stories that they typically had in the theatrical cartoons. Oh, yeah, yeah, they had to do something. <laughs> and they had to flesh out some more stuff simply to make the concept last. Yeah. And then yeah. Richie Rich uh, improved by doing the adventure stories, which were more like Tintin or something, rather than yeah. the just general abundance of wealth dollar bill sign gags, you know, that they'd yeah. done yeah. for the first decade or so. You know, so I get that, but you know, sometimes they change it. Like, like they did a live action Richie Rich show on Netflix a few years back. That should just go unwatched. It's really bad. <laughs> um, basically, uh, the kid is not like the way Richie Rich is designed. You know, it's like he's kind of a sympathetic rich character. No, nah, he's just like a little Trump. You know, it's like you know, <laughs> you know, it's like wow. And they they made the dad on the show like an idiot, and uh, they made Arona into like uh, uh, played by a sexy teenage model person. So you know, if you're watching it, it's, you kind of get a sicky feeling because you know it's like you know this girl's only like 16 in real life. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is dad doing with the with the kids robot? Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Well, well, I guess they just don't even know what their audience is. Yeah. Or maybe they're whatever. I don't know. I've never seen it, so yeah. I. Yeah. Well, the, the hard part is like if one version of Richie Rich doesn't succeed for whatever reason, they think, oh, we can't do it that way anymore. We have to do it this new way. And it's like maybe it was just marketed wrong, or maybe the timing is wrong. There's something to be said about the way that they did it. Like, if they did a good Richie Rich adventure series based on the stories that we liked in the mid '70s, you know, I think it would work. You know, but sure, yeah, solid storytelling with sympathetic characters that children could relate to. There would be an audience; they just have to find the audience, yeah. just reach that audience. Yeah. There's always, I mean, there's always an audience for good storytelling. Yeah, for good stories, sympathetic yeah. characters. Come on, mm-hmm. it's the story of history. Yeah. And that's the frustrating thing, is they do all these remakes, reboots, and yeah, I'll agree with you. There's not a good story. It's all for naught, really. So, <laughs> you know, like, they're, they're like you know, this just happened, of course, this will air a little bit later, but, you know, the, recently the they they put out another version of Charlie's Angels in the theater, and uh, with Captain Picard, well, basically Patrick Stewart, playing Bosley. And it's like, well, no, he's a, he's a good actor, and, you know, he's been Picard, and he was Professor X, and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, you know, why, and why did they do yet another Charlie's Angels? I mean, it's like, it wasn't that good a concept to begin with, and here it is again. Then they're bemoaning the fact, it's not doing very well. Well, yeah, I could have told you that. <laughs> but, anyway. <laughs> yeah, Charlie's Angels, I mean, oh. it was never very good as far as yeah. stories. Yeah, yeah. It was because of the women who were on it. Yes. That's the only reason it lasted. Yeah. And and you have to recreate if you. It's very difficult to recreate that specific zeitgeist. Right. Because that was very much of the time. Yeah. And it was all about Farrah's hair. Yes. Come on. <laughs> that was so much a part of it. And yes. And you can't. And there's no way to replicate that specifically. You have to find something that's going to be Farrah's hair to make this show sell. Right. <laughs> you can't make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, sometimes, yeah, it truly is lightning in a bottle, as a, as, you know, and uh, I I don't want to say and bemoan and be one of those naysayers say Harvey Comics can't make a major comeback, but, you know, it's been 30 years, so it's really difficult for me to say yes, it will, you know, but uh, I do try to enjoy and buy the uh, American Mythology ones as best I can, and I love it that you're doing the artwork on them, so I appreciate that, so. <laughs> well, I'm really happy to be doing it, and even though it's, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's not the most uh, remunerative job I've ever had, <laughs> but I actually love drawing these characters, Yeah. so it's really, really fun. Um, and, I, 
and I know how that is. I mean, I talk, you, you, our mutual friend Dan Parent, you know, he's like, you know, for years when there wasn't any, anything being published, he was saying, oh, I wish I could publish. I mean, I wish I could draw the Harvey characters, you know, and here he's doing Archie and getting, you know, respect for that. And he says, no, I'd love to do the Archie, the Harvey characters, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. well, <laughs> but. Yeah, he did, he did some uh, Harvey spoofs back in the early, mid 90s, maybe late 90s, mid 90s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember. Oh my gosh, I have them all somewhere. Hmm. Not sure if I'm aware of that. He the only a, he did a self-published comic, and it was sort of this spoof romance comic. I can't remember the name of it. Hmm. But it was sort of the covers usually spoof their rom- DC romance comics from the '60s and '70s. Hmm. Um, and he did a couple Harvey spoofs in there. Okay. One where Richie, where the Richie character had a dog. Mm-hmm. It was supposed to be like Dollar, but it was a big sheep dog, and it kept <laughs> farting. Oh. And that was like one of the big jokes in the story. It's like this terrible, terrible smell, and it was the dog. Hmm. I'm gonna have to ask him about this. I think there was a little. I'll get him on the show and ask him. Is it when? When did you do this? I haven't read them in thir- in 20 years, so I might not be remembering them exactly correctly. Yeah, but, but I mean, if they're Harvey Dad parodies... Dad Parent did yeah. do these. Yeah. yeah. Dad okay. Parent did do these. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get a hold of him and try to get him on the show and ask him about those, you know. I know he'll talk to me, so... I he'll just... hate, tell me he might hate me. Uh, no. <laughs> for bringing these up <laughs> into public consciousness again. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. No. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, well, I mean, we're going going on for a while here. Is there anything else you'd yeah. like to say? And you know, I can always bring uh, you back. We could talk about more uh, Harvey or Archie or something uh, else. <laughs> uh, well, I'm happy to come back on. I don't know whether I can talk about more Harvey. I think I'm pretty exhausted at all. <laughs> except my favorite Casper story from when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an issue of Casper the Ghostly Trio. It was the issue where the trio turns back into babies and there's oh, yeah. a giant who sh- with a sh- with a tiny castle and he shrinks to get inside the castle but when he goes out of the castle he's big <laughs> um it was like casper and the ghostly trail num- number three that sounds right yeah um, it doesn't have a very good uh rating in harveyville fun times for that issue uh, <laughs> and i wrote <laughs> that, that one sur- <laughs> which i was actually surprised to see because i think well, I don't know. Maybe it's not a very good story. When I was a kid, I loved it. It was my yeah. very favorite issue. <laughs> Some friend borrowed it and folded the cover, Oof. and I was so angry. Well, I, I did the reviews on those Casper and Ghostly Trio, and okay. it's like, that's a very rich series, too. It just only lasted about seven issues, though. But, yeah. I mean, yeah. they have the Fatso for President one. They have the one where they go to ABC Land and stuff like that. So there's some really good stories in there. So if I... If I did knock that one, I'll have to look at my review again. It might be because you're comparing it to other stories that are really, really off the charts good. So, you know. Sure, sure, whatever. And, you know, everybody's yeah. out, uh, you know, everybody has their own opinion. Yeah. I'm not arguing with that. I'm just saying that my opinion. How dare you? No, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, it was a pleasure again. Do you have anything to plug here since we're at that plug time or anything else? for? Are you making any appearances in 2020 or anything? thing that you might want to promote? Sure, yeah. I have several projects coming out. Um, Age of Bronze Volume 2 Sacrifice is coming out in color. Uh, it'll be out in February 2020. Okay. Oh, my color is just still working very hard and I'm, I am helping, working on working on those pages, color pages, his color pages too. Um, I, IDW, I don't know if I'm allowed to announce this, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> uh, we're doing a little Nemo sequel yeah. at IDW. I'm writing it. Gabriel Rodriguez, who drew the first Little Nemo series, is drawing it. This is just going to be a one shot. Hmm. Um, I am really, really excited about this because I think my script is really fun. But of course, I'm hardly objective. But anyway, <laughs> more Little Nemo, more Little Nemo from IDW. Yeah. I'm not sure when it's going to be out. Okay. Gabe is drawing it right now. Mm-hmm. But I don't know when when the pub, when publication is. Um, I did a one page story uh, for a, a, an anthology book called Hey Amateur, which is being published by Shelley Bond. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, my page is called. It's it's a book all about how to do things, and there's like at least fifty cartoonists all telling how to do something. Mm. Uh, my my page is how to perform an on day or pirouette mm. in in nine panels. So you can see that. Uh, what else is coming out? Um, oh, there's uh, obviously Casper's Spooksville is still happening. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still inking a story for issue four on that. I still got to draw a couple stories that Mike hasn't written the script for yet. Yeah. But that'll be. I don't know when that's solicited for exactly, but we still got several more issues of that to go. Mm-hmm. And uh, as far as I can remember right now, that's about it. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> that's something to go on. I mean, you'll probably be back before the next thing. Cause <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so that'll be fine. You know, we could think of another topic and talk again. I really enjoyed this. And okay, great. Yeah, thank- Nice talking to you too, Mark. Thank you for being on the show again, and I will talk to you soon. My pleasure. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye, everybody. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Eric Shanauer, for being my special guest. Episode number 61 will be coming soon. If you would like to comment and or be a guest on this podcast, please drop me a line at funideas.mark at gmail.com. Become a patron of Mark Arnold and Fun Ideas Productions. If everyone listening just contributed a dollar a month, that would be a tremendous help in continuing the production of my books and this podcast. Also, subscribe to my YouTube channel. The opening and closing music for the Fun Ideas podcast is provided courtesy of Andrew the Slow Poisoner Goldfarb and is used with permission. This has been the Fun Ideas podcast. This is Mark Arnold speaking. This episode is copyright 2020, Fun Ideas Productions. Thank you and good night. of your loot.